So my name is Nick Morgan. I'm a serious violence researcher at the Home Office. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to present at the evidence-based uh, policing conference. And obviously now that this is happening virtually, I'm gonna try and talk you through my presentation, uh, which is uh, a summary of uh, some research, recent research we completed on homicide. Uh, the main purpose of the research was to try and better understand the trends in homicide. Um, but uh, what we also try and do, and which I'm going to focus on a bit today, is you know what those what those findings mean for our response to homicide, um, including the enforcement response. So where I want to start is um, these are four headlines um, with different types of homicide. And the first thing that any researcher finds when they start looking at individual cases of homicide is that it is an incredibly diverse crime. Uh, so the top left there is a county line stabbing case. The top right is a, um, a nighttime economy case, a one punch homicide over a spilt drink. Um, and uh, in the middle, we have a corporate manslaughter case, a, a care home neglect case, and down at the bottom, a domestic murder suicide. All uh, equally tragic, but um, all very, very different in terms of their circumstances and motivations. And so that homicide is a, a very broad collection of, of different types of um, cases in that sense. Um, and it's quite hard to pin it down uh, in that way. Um, there are perhaps three categories of homicide that we can kind of pull out within the data um, and um, kind of mark off a little bit more clearly. Uh, one of those is domestic cases. And for the purpose of the research, we include within domestic cases, um, uh, cases in which family members have killed um, uh, children and babies. Um, and also kind of extended romantic relationship cases. So where the current partner kills, um, you know, the ex partner or something like that. Um, but even including all of those domestic cases only make up around about 30 percent of homicides over the last five years, um, perhaps slightly less than people think. Uh, the other two categories that we can kind of quite clearly group together in the data are terrorism cases. Um, obviously, there have been some of those recently, although they still only make up around about 4% over the last five years. Um, and corporate manslaughter cases. Corporate manslaughter became part of homicide from 2008. And we are seeing a slightly increasing trickle of these, um, particularly as linked to that headline uh, to do with care home neglect cases. But even if, uh, you know, that, again, it's a very small percentage, about about 3%. So taking those together, um, you still only add up to less than 40% of homicide, which leaves, as the pie chart shows, this kind of rump of other cases that are quite hard to pin down. Um, so the point I wanted to make was that the, you know, the, the sort of tactics we use to respond to other types of crime, which are typically to sort of understand the most likely people to be involved and understand the most likely places to be involved are less uh, easy to do with homicide um, in terms of the places on the bottom right there you know you take the highest crime borough in London and they ha it had 8,000 robberies so it's fairly clear you want to you know c concentrate resources there but it only had six homicides so it's not quite the same in terms of a kind of a hotspot policing response so it's quite homicide uh, is quite tricky in that sense However, the kind of paradox of homicide is that when you when you look at and research the trends, you get these really clear patterns that don't seem to go with a crime type that is kind of incredibly diverse and likely to be driven by lots and lots and lots of different factors. Here's the first kind of pattern in the trends. This is a chart produced by Manuel Eisner, professor at Cambridge. He plotted loads and loads and loads of countries uh, and their homicide trends. And although you get, you know, you do get some variation, you do get these kind of localized spikes in the data, they all show this common long wave, an increase from around about 1960 through to uh, 1980, 1990, uh, uh, and then this kind of drop off in general. Um, there is variation, but you know, if you if you look at all the countries here, 
in around about 1960, not a single one of them manages to re re retain that lower level of homicide through into the 80s and 90s. So you get this common long wave pattern as if there's a sort of global component to the driver of the trend. The other uh, thing we found in the trends, which is slightly hard to square with this kind of incredibly diverse set of uh, causal factors, is uh, what's shown in these two charts, these sudden increases and decreases in homicide rates. Uh, so chart on the left uh, shows uh, Chicago and New York, chart on the right shows London and other regions in England and Wales. One important methodological point here, uh, chart on the left is rates per 100,000 residents, chart in the right is rates per million. Um, so it does not show, putting the two charts next to each other, that London has a, around about the same rate as Chicago. In fact, London has a rate around about 10 times less. It would be right down the bottom of that uh, US chart once you convert them to the same scale. Don't let anyone uh, say that London has a higher homicide rate than New York, uh, despite what you might have seen in the media. Anyway, the real point uh, for the research about this chart is that homicide, as shown by the Chicago line and the London line, sadly, um, can increase very, very quickly in a very, very short space of time, which, when you think about it, is quite hard to square with um, a set of crimes that have an incredibly diverse set of circumstances and motivations. So that's what the, the research, in a way, was trying to explain, trying to unpick that paradox. What did we do? Uh, well, we basically did three things. Firstly, we reviewed all the data we could find for homicide in England and Wales. Then we did the same for other countries. And finally, we did a systematic review of the literature on drivers of homicide. And that made it into a very long project uh, because systematic means you sort of effectively have to look at everything. Uh, so we reviewed more than 300 academic papers and books. And overall, there was little agreement on the sort of drivers of homicide loads and loads of factors suggested but it's not as if it kind of converged on a you know this is the thing um uh so however i don't think what that means is that there's sort of we need to despair there's nothing useful i think there are useful things we can pick out and that's what we're going to try and do and that's what we try and do in the research so uh this does take us kind of uh, we do take quite a sweeping look at homicide in the research uh, we look uh, across quite a lot wide span of time and we look across lots of countries um, and I, th I think that's very useful and I'll, I'll try and explain why but to kind of anchor us to begin with um, this I think is is hopefully what what we all know which is what is going on with homicide right now so as of 2017-18 um, uh, we saw a rise in homicide from 2013-14 up to 2017-18, as the bar chart shows. And uh, then, you know, it's kind of stabilised since, but not really come down. Uh, the homicides that we see in the most recent years are generally male-on-male -male cases. 70% 70, 70 of victims were male in 17-18 around about 90% of suspects male. So the majority are male and male, most age 15 to 44. Very importantly, most victims and suspects are white, um, but rates for black hom homicide victimization and perpetration are higher. The other thing uh, that uh, falls really clearly out of the data for recent homicides, in fact, uh, all homicides is, um, a strong relationship with neighbourhood deprivation level. So we uh, matched every single homicide to uh, the indices of uh, multiple deprivation, produced this chart, and as you can see, there's a very clear relationship. The, uh, de on the right here, decile number 10 is the most deprived decile, on the left, the most affluent decile, and you can see a much higher proportion of homicides in the most deprived areas. Whether you're looking at the location of the homicide, victim address, or suspect address. That's where we are now. But what I want to show is that actually that's not where homicide has always been in England and Wales. And it's also not what homicide looks like in some other countries. And I think this is really important for understanding our kind of, and almost giving us a kind of, you know, some real hope about how we can change homicide and respond to it and bring it down. 
So this is the long term trend in England and Wales, uh, homicide rates going back to 1900. Uh, two points to make here. One is uh, it's not the best of times and it's not the worst of times currently. Uh, where we are right now, uh, we are higher than where the rate was uh, for most of the 20th century. Uh, so between 1900 and around about 1975 to 1980, uh, homicide rates were lower than where we are now. For the period through the 80s, 90s and early 2000s to the peak, um, it was higher than where we are right now. Uh, the other point uh, to quickly draw out of this is just look how quickly recently homicide has fallen and then risen. Um, very, very, very sharp swings, uh, as we noted before. So the first thing we did with the research was to effectively break that trend, that long term trend down by whether the victim was male or female. And this uh, produced the first really clear and quite surprising finding of the research, which is that for that first 70 years of the 20th century, 70, 75 years, um, male and female homicide was equally split between male victimization and female victimization. The lines are almost on top of each other. So the trend was the same, gradual downward to the sort of low point in the in around about the 50s, a few uh, volatile spikes uh, during the war years. Um, but in general, down to this low point in the 50s, and then a, a gradual rise through the 60s and 70s. And then suddenly the two trends split apart and all the recent upwards and downwards has been driven by male victimization and female victimization is actually um, a pretty good news story since around about 1980 um, in that it is it's a bit of volatility, but it is generally trended uh, downwards um, and is it. Uh, not quite its lowest point ever, but but you know a much more comparable to its lowest point uh, compared to uh, male victimization. Um, so it's a similar picture when we split by age as well, in that homicide looked so so different uh, back in the early years of the 20th century. If you look back here, so these are uh, the same trend broken down by age. There were about as many homicides against under ones in total as there were against all of those aged 15 to 34, the grey line, uh, put together, uh, which is so different now. I mean, these lines are so far apart now. Um, and so, again, you have this sort of splitting apart. At this time, it happens uh, at the start of the, the long wave rise from the 60s. Um, you get this uh, suddenly from that point on. Uh, homicide became dominated by cases involving victims aged over 15. Before that, um, much more kind of equal across these age uh, groupings. The chart on the right um, splits homicide, the long term trend, both by age and sex at the same time. And you get this pattern that the uh, sharp increase and decreases that we've seen recently and the things that are really driving the trend these kind of short wave spikes uh, are focused within victims male victims aged 15 to 30, 44 and all other victims follow this other trend what we're calling a longer way slower wave trend and still largely decreasing currently um, so that's all female victims or and all child and baby male victims and all older male victims tend to follow that trend. Two other uh, facts about this longer wave trend is one, this shows quite a strong correlation with uh, overall crime, um, which uh, also increased from the 60s, peaked uh, in the mid 90s, as we know, and then sort of fell recently, and is largely still falling. You know, if you look at violence in totality, measured by the survey or hospital statistics, still going down. It's only the serious violence offences, knife crime, gun crime and robbery, which have gone up recently. And those show much greater correlation with the shorter, uh, the other short wave trend, as I'm going to call it, the blue line uh, on the chart on the right, uh, the males aged 44, 15 to 44 homicides. The second fact about the long wave trend is that it, it is also uh, correlates with um, some of those niche categories of homicide. So, for example, sexually motivated homicides, serial killer homicides, 
Um, homicides involving uh, severe mental health issues and infanticide cases, they, these also follow these long wave patterns um, based on the data and research that we have, i.e. a sort of a gradual increase from the 60s and largely decreasing right now. So what we're going to do now is uh, focus on that period since they've split apart, the two trends, um, and have a look at what's driven these kind of shorter wave spikes. Um, so this chart looks at uh, both uh, the uh, gender of victim and suspect at the same time, and uh, two clear findings. One is uh, the yellow line, the male on male cases, clearly sort of dominates the trend and has driven the, been the main reason for the early 2000s peak, the fall, and then the recent rise. But also notice the green line, which kind of pokes its head up at the points where homicide really increases. So this is the uh, early 2000s peak. This is the recent increase. And this is uh, no suspect cases uh, against male victims, uh, female victims, no suspect, no suspect on female, somewhat similar. Um, this means, in the data, this means uh, there's no suspect formally charged. So not literally no suspect at all, uh, which is important to point out. But th it, that does seem to uh, rise when uh, homicide rises, which perhaps gives us some sort of clue about the type of cases that might be coming into homicide departments um, at that time of very rapid increase. The other clue uh, uh, about the shorter, sharper peaks uh, comes from this chart, which is that clearly when homicide rises very sharply, weapons tend to be involved in England, Wales, particularly knives uh, and to a lesser extent guns. So if you look at the blunt instrument line, it's, it's largely flat, it sort of follows the long wave pattern. There's no real increase in the early 2000s and actually it's still decreasing. Whereas knives, were clearly important for the early 2000s peak and very important for the recent rise. Uh, and gun homicides, um, also important for the uh, 2000, early 2000s peak, less so for the recent rise. Um, and then uh, finally, on the England and Wales trends, um, the other factors that we can now pull out of the data, only since 2007-8, are drug and alcohol related homicides. Um, this obviously formed a, a big part of the serious violence strategy. Uh, clearly, uh, drug-related homicides uh, formed quite a big part of the increase, the recent increase since 2014-15, whereas alcohol-related homicides largely flat. Um, important to point out that the definition of drug-related homicides is kind of necessarily broad. Um, it includes um, basically any homicides in which the police have checked the box saying that they are aware that either the victim or the suspect is a known drug user or dealer. Um, and as the chart on the bottom right shows, um, there are more cases involving drug users, um, but the proportion of homicides involving dealers has increased at a slightly faster rate. So overall, uh, on the short waves, um, what the data is suggesting are that um, they're driven by male and male cases, by cases involving weapons, and um, by uh, cases uh, linked to drugs uh, to some extent. Okay, so part two of the research looked at um, international trends in homicide. Uh, we start with a quick comparison of where England and Wales sits globally. Um, so the big chart shows uh, five countries where we were able to obtain reasonably comparable definition of homicide across nations. That is tricky. Homicides, uh, countries do not um, always define homicide in the same way. So you do need to be uh, careful when comparing across countries. Um, but overall, uh, England and Wales can still be considered uh, a low homicide country globally, despite the recent increase. Uh, much lower than the US, for example, there at 5.2 homicides per 100,000. England and Wales around about 1.2. And the Global Homicide Index estimates the global average actually around about 6.1 uh, per 100,000 residents. Uh, so England and Wales well below that and quite comparable to the average for Western Europe generally of about 1.2. Australia is an interesting one at the bottom there with a lower, slightly lower uh, rate than England and Wales. It used to have a higher rate. It's now lower. And um, we'll come back to that uh, to have a look why that might be.
The real point of the international chapter, though, in the report, uh, there is loads more information, by the way, on international data and trends in the report than I'm going to show you here. I'm going to rattle through things very quickly. So do have a look at the more detailed information. Um, but the real point of it was to look at the trends. And this revealed um, two main findings, one of which we've already kind of seen with this chart here, that when we looked across nations, we found this long wave pattern um, in almost every nation that we we studied. Uh, certainly all Western European nations, Australia, New Zealand, the Scandinavian countries, um, uh, US, Canada, and so on. Um, the only countries that didn't follow this pattern were some East Asian countries, particularly Japan, which basically just had a decline in homicide through this entire period. And um, the uh, some Central and South American countries, which tended to have an increase, particularly recently, countries like Brazil and Venezuela and Mexico. Um, but um, so when you when we looked at uh, countries like the Netherlands, like the US and Canada, as shown on this chart uh, on this slide, um, they all tended to follow that long wave pattern of a rise in the 60s, followed by a fall uh, through the uh, late 90s and 2000s. Um, with some more mixed trends recently. Um, the point about this slide is this was regardless of the level of homicide. So if you take the chart on the top right, um, the US and Canada have very different levels of homicide, but you can see that when you sort of equalize those levels on the bottom right and just look at the trends, um, they're incredibly similar. Um, and there's another example there for England and Wales and the Netherlands on the left. Um, However, if you look carefully, what you can see, which is the sort of second conclusion here, is that the sort of, although the long wave, the general rise from the 60s and the fall thereafter is uh, present in all of them, uh, some of the local, some of the spikes, the particular spikes are local. So uh, on the US and Canada chart, the, the peaks don't quite match. And if you look carefully, England and Wales has this later peak um, that's sort of specific uh, to that uh, and not seen so much in other countries. Um, so we had a closer look at those short, sharp peaks in a similar way as we did to England and Wales. We looked at breaking the trend down into male and female victimization. So this is the US uh, and I'll just talk through it because it is an important chart. So the green bars are the overall homicide trend in the US. So the green bars match the um, red line on the top right chart there. Um, the red line on this chart is the ratio of male to female victimization. It's measured on the right axis. So the fact that it crosses, uh, it's around about 3.5 through the whole series, means that there are around about three and a half times as many male victims of homicide in the US as there are female victims. So as in the UK, uh, it's very much a male on male crime in the US. Uh, the point though of this chart really is to show that when homicide, you get these short sharp peaks in homicide in the green line, you also get short sharp peaks in the red line. Uh, and this follows the sort of volatility, those upward downward bits really, really well. Um, meaning that the short sharp peaks are driven by increases in male victimization, pretty much as we found in England and Wales. However, the longer wave pattern of this kind of big rise through the 60s, the more kind of bell-shaped pattern fall through the 90s isn't reflected in the red line. The red line, if you drew a line through it, it would be pretty flat through the whole thing. This one has a long wave pattern. So in other words, the long wave is uh, to be seen in both male and female victimization, as we found in uh, England and Wales. OK, so the third part of the research looked at the drivers of homicide. And uh, this was the literature review part. And um, I'm going to start this section with a really important caveat that these I'm going to give some really, really summarized findings. Um, it's really important to point out that the literature itself is much more uh, complicated and nuanced and contradictory than I'm going to present it now. Um, so I do have a, a look at the full report, um, and that is a really important caveat that this is going to be a sort of a more simplistic look at it than the literature itself um, 
it actually is. Um, we're going to start with the long wave and possible drivers of that. First thing to say is, as the chart on the left shows, it's um, it's quite hard, I think, to explain the long wave using either um, policing and criminal justice variables or economic variables. Um, as the chart shows, uh, policing numbers were, were at their a very low level in the 50s when homicide was also at its lowest and the two trends tended to increase together uh, through the 60s and 70s. Now now that does not mean that policing has no effect on homicide um, and I'm going to come back to that and show in fact I think it, it really does and it's actually really important but what it does mean I think is that it's hard to explain this this long wave pattern with policing factors and I think this is this is kind of common sense we know that um, there is an element of homicide and violence in general that is that is way beyond police control and is more to do with, you know, um, uh, bigger picture factors. And it's a similar thing with the economy. Um, basically, economic variables were generally very healthy through the uh, 60s, uh, meaning it's very hard to explain uh, that big increase in homicide, the kind of long wave pattern. Turning to the, the uh, right of the slide, uh, what does uh, emerge from the literature as a factor is the baby boom generation um, after the war had a, a generation or, or two, really, um, the, of just higher birth rates. And um, that is going to mechanically create a kind of slight long wave bulge in the homicide data just because there's an age crime curve with homicide. We saw uh, victims and perpetrators aged 15 to 44. You're more likely to be involved in a homicide, just mechanically speaking. So if you have a baby boom generation, all else equal, you're going to get this sort of slight bulge in homicides over time as those people age into and then out of um, that more uh, crime prone uh, age group. But what the studies show really clearly is that whilst this must be a factor, it cannot explain the whole thing because the wave is simply too big for that. So there must be kind of other multiplier effects going on to kind of multiply that up. What might they be? Uh, three suggestions on this slide that come out of the literature. Alcohol uh, consumption shows a very good uh, correlation over the long term, this kind of long wave with um, with homicide. It's another chart from Manuel Eisner at Cambridge um, showing showing that. Um, the question I think here is, is alcohol really a sort of true cause or is it the, the trigger? Um, uh, and do other factors explain both the rise in consumption and, and homicide rate? Um, I think in general what the evidence would show on alcohol is that um, people who are who already have it sort of increases the likelihood of a violent situation in individuals who are already prone to aggression. Um, two other possibilities that come out of the literature top right. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of literature on um, changes in values and belief systems um, and the long wave may be to do with this. Um, not going to go into this one or the next one in a huge amount of detail. Do have a look at there's a much more on this in the report. But basically, there's an argument that um, uh, you had this sort of transition from an era of Victorian restraint into the more hedonistic 1960s, um, when self-control suddenly became uncool, if you like. Uh, and that this may have translated through to violence and at the very sharp end of that homicide. And then you had a, an era through the 1990s of more restraint again, as things like uh, AIDS and the drug epidemics um, sort of brought self-control back into fashion. Um, at the bottom there, another theory is a change about routine activities. And this uh, suggested by Cohen and Felsen. Um, is is about things like um, female employment increased dramatically through the 60s and 70s, uh, the number of people living in houses on their own and so on. And they argued that this would uh, rather mechanically create more situations in which homicides might arise. So, for example, women coming home from late, home from work late on their own and that sort of thing. Uh, it feels quite quite a persuasive theory uh, for the possible rise in homicide. I think the, the trouble is those trends, as that chart shows, tended just to sort of increase. So it's harder to explain the downward part of the trend. The routine activity theorists tend to uh, explain that through the uh, movement to online activity. 
Um, although, again, uh, you could argue that that has some problems given the uh, recent increase in homicide and the fact that actually some people have uh, blamed social media as part of that. But those are some suggested theories. Uh, another one, and, and, and I think it's fair to say in general here that the causes of the long wave are probably uh, less certain than the short wave ones that we will come on to. However, I think this uh, explanation of the long wave probably deserves further investigation. Um, what we also found in the literature was this kind of pattern of a bulge in risk factors a generation before the long wave really started to take effect, particularly family risk factors. So as the two charts on the left show, alongside the baby boom generation, you do get um, from the 50s, a big rise in things like birth to teenage mothers and birth into large families, uh, into large families. And these are documented risk factors for crime, violence, and at the sharp end of that, I guess, homicide. Um, and don't forget that the long wave of homicide correlates pretty well with, with crime overall. Um, so it's interesting that you do get these um, quite dramatic changes in uh, risk factors uh, uh, that sort of correlate quite well with this long wave. Uh, that is not to say at all that um, everyone born to a teenage mother or into a large family will go on to commit crime. Absolutely not the case. But just statistically speaking, you're getting a slightly higher uh, level of risk. Uh, the other factor that comes into that is, uh, as the chart on the top right shows, is we now have some reasonably good survey data on, on abuse. And when you break that down by age and sort of work that back to the years in which people were born, um, you get a similar pattern. The, the data seems to show a sort of rise and then fall, uh, which is sort of mirrored in this chart. Um, and uh, you get the fact that um, there looks to be some evidence of a, of a kind of rise uh, through the 50s of uh, people who grow up to report abuse, physical, uh, sexual or witnessing abuse. And then clearly, clearly, there's been a very dramatic fall in that since the 70s, just as there were falls in birth to teenage mothers, family size and, and other risk factors that we go on to document in the report. Uh, so I think this is interesting. I, I don't think we know enough yet about why there were these bulges in risk factors, particularly on the increase side. I think we do know more about why they so dramatically decreased from the uh, sort of 70s onwards. I think that's quite a lot to do with growth in women's and children's rights, things like um, the pill, uh, uh, changes to abortion legislation, um, and also changed to uh, divorce legislation as well, which we talk about quite a lot in the report, which uh, I think there's pretty good evidence gave a lot of women the ability to escape households um, in which domestic violence was, was going on. And of course, many of those households will have had children, which might have affected those individuals growing up. So I think that deserves uh, more attention. As I said, I think we can probably be slightly more certain about the factors uh, that work for the short wave. Um, and the first thing to say about that is they cannot be the same factors. Um, these charts we've seen before, they show the sudden dramatic changes in homicide in Chicago and London. And it's just not possible for those to be driven by sort of changes in risk factors in the population or cultural effects or those sorts of things, because they just happen too fast for that. And that's kind of what Gary Lafree is saying in that quote at the bottom there. So instead, what we found in the literature um, for the short, sharp uh, changes, important factor, I think, is uh, this kind of nexus of drug markets, gangs and organised crime. So some specific examples of evidence we found in the literature for this. Uh, Miami, uh, I was personally quite surprised to find that that was known as the murder capital of the world back in 1980. And there was a well-documented uh, drug war going on at that time for control of the powder cocaine market. It's not to say there weren't other things going on as well at that time, which might have been important, but drugs sort of becomes a bit of a common denominator in these examples. The most documented example is probably the uh, crack epidemic in the US, uh, where a number of papers show that the kind of spread of the epidemic correlated with the spread of uh, spikes in homicide. Uh, 
Uh, again, another well-documented example, uh, the, the recent rise in homicide in Mexico is very clearly drug-related. Um, and then the evidence, uh, there isn't an awful lot of research, um, uh, particularly not in England and Wales, on, on the effect of gangs and their link to drug markets and that effect on homicide. But what we did find was a clear finding that um, deprived areas, and this takes us back to the chart we saw earlier about um, the correlation between deprivation and homicide, deprived areas are definitely more likely to have gangs. But the gangs put an upward pressure on homicide over and above the um, structural effects of deprivation. So there's a kind of a multiplier effect there. The other thing that came out of the literature, um, uh, which um, is, is um, specific points in the homicide trend, seem to match up quite well to specific changes in the uh, illicit drug market in the UK. Uh, these are only suggestive, they are not uh, concrete by any means, um, but uh, for example, um, in everywhere really, uh, the mass illicit drugs market really kicked off in the 1960s, which is the start of the long wave, as we've seen. In the UK, though, what the a crucial change I think came in the late 70s, um, and a number of studies have sort of tried to document the drugs market in the UK, and really found that up till the late 70s, um, a lot of markets were, were actually quite peaceful and were controlled by um, user dealer collectives and that sort of thing. And then suddenly in the late 70s, you have the start of the heroin epidemic and organized crime really becomes involved in drug markets in a big way. And to some extent, sort of subcontracts the street end of that to um, urban street gangs. And you suddenly have uh, young males um, becoming involved in the street end of the drug market and and that the potential for violence uh i think probably escalated at that time and don't forget of course that's the moment in the uk trend when we really see that splitting of the male and female victimization and suddenly male victimization becomes um the dominant driver of the trend uh you then uh, through the 90s and don't when England and Wales has that kind of extra peak in the early 2000s that m many countries do not. And um, quite a lot of uh, intelligence and media reporting linking um, uh, certain organised crime groups and the uh, entry really of crack into the UK. Um, there is a reasonable correlation as the chart on the bottom right shows between uh, crack incidents and uh, homicide, um, both for that early 2000s peak and the recent increase. And of course, with the recent increase, we now have um, a measure of drug related homicide, as I showed earlier, which also shows a correlation. So nothing absolutely concrete and definite, but quite a lot of um, suggestive indicators. So I think it, it, uh, drugs, gangs, organised crime, that kind of nexus is probably important in explaining the, the short, sharp rises in homicide. One factor that's important to mention that I don't think we know enough about is the specifics of those triggers. I think destabilization of drug markets is obviously important, but when they might be caused by you know a sudden shift in supply or a sudden shift in demand or a sudden shift in the level of enforcement, um, we probably don't know enough about that yet. Finally, the other uh, factor that I think we can say is important in the short waves, more on the kind of positive side in terms of bringing them down, uh, in particular that sort of big decrease in the UK trend from the early 2000s, um, is the sort of policing and criminal justice system response. Um, in the report, we look at a uh, relationship with um, kind of incarceration and clearance rates. I'm not going to dwell on that now, uh, lots of detail on that in the report. What I want to focus on are the bottom two bullets. Um, police resources, there are a number of papers uh, looking at this and the finding is there that what we found was that uh, the papers were reasonably consistent in that all else equal, um, having more police led to fewer homicides. I think what we've covered off quite well is that all else is never equal and other factors can play a huge part. Uh, which is um, why, uh, as I showed earlier, I don't think you get that correlation uh, that you might expect with policing and homicide. And I think also, obviously, because as homicide goes up, there are calls for more police. But 
clearly um, studies have shown that there are uh, successful and proven strategies that can be used to reduce homicide. Um, focused deterrence um, is one. Uh, it's struggled to be implemented in the UK, but that feels like something we need to uh, persevere with and find a method that works for us. Conditional repression, uh, another technique with um, some support for um, uh, working in drug markets in particular. The one I want to dwell on though, um, the Street Crime Initiative uh, is an interesting one because it was well evaluated. It came in as a policing um, activity that came in in the early 2000s um, and correlates really well with the decline in homicide. It, it wasn't tested for homicide, it was tested for robbery and shown to have a really important effect on robbery. Um, and uh, what I haven't mentioned so far is that when you look across countries, including England and Wales, there's a very strong correlation between homicide trends and robbery trends. And when you look at the offending history of um, homicide offenders, robbery is one of those offences that um, is most prevalent. Uh, so it seems logical that an, uh, an intervention that had an effect on robbery might have had an effect on, on homicide and therefore helped to have contributed to that big fall uh, through the uh, 2000s that we saw in England and Wales. Um, just briefly at the end, um, a number of studies also talk about trust and legitimacy. It's a big issue in the US at the moment um, with the kind of idea that uh, there's been a Ferguson effect, the, the well-publicised uh, shooting by police of certain individuals um, leading to a kind of spike in homicides. That's the idea. Um, as I say, this is some suggestive correlations in the US. Um, we didn't find any sort of concrete quantitative evidence really uh, to support this yet, but it, it's something that uh, requires further testing. Um, I think the other important point to note is that um, it's almost certainly the case that the um, uh, legitimacy and sort of police community relations can have a big, big effect on, on solving homicides because of the willingness um, or otherwise of witnesses to come forward. To conclude, I just want to start the conclusion um, uh, and say again that uh, this has been a, a real whistle stop tour. Um, we've tried to summarise uh, some of the findings and make them useful for a policy response. But to reiterate again, this is very much kind of our reading of the data and evidence. That is not to say it's the only possible reading. So do have a look at the full report to sort of reveal some of that uh, complexity um, and contradiction. Um, but I think what we've identified and I think is quite a useful way of hopefully looking at homicide and gives us a way into that paradox that we uh, noticed at the beginning uh, is to think about homicide in relation to these two kind of trends that seem to underlie the overall trend. First of all, the long wave um, where the drivers, um, as we saw, were probably more kind of global, big picture things, uh, social change, cultural change and changes in kind of family level uh, risk factors. Um, with that wave, we saw that it tended to uh, be linked uh, more to alcohol and involve a kind of wide range of individuals, often those with a particular set of vulnerabilities. So uh, women suffering domestic violence, uh, violence against the very old and and young babies, infanticides would be included in that long wave trend. And also those with things like mental health issues, addiction problems, homelessness, etc. Um, the other type of wave uh, and trend that we identified was this kind of shorter, sharper spike. And that seems to be linked much more to this nexus of drugs, gangs and organised crime and involve a much more specific group of people. They're basically male on male cases, often involving 15 to 44 year olds, uh, tending to be from deprived communities and using weapons. Um, so um, that that's the, the kind of headline conclusion. And again, I think uh, it was sort of uh, hinted at and uh, we used the paper by Manuel Eisner again, the quotes uh, from the left are from him, where he looks at high and low homicide societies across time. So a much broader span than just England and Wales as we focused on but he found some, some evidence of a, of a similar sort of pattern.
So the question, I guess, and the, the real concluding point here is, so, OK, that's all very well and good. But what does it mean for our our response, our uh, kind of governmental response, but also particularly the uh, enforcement response? Well, first of all, I think the the, the long wave, um, to the extent that it was carried on a wave of kind of slightly higher level of risk factors within society, um, Early intervention is uh, clearly uh, a recommendation that flows from this report. Um, there's good evidence that uh, early intervention can work in reducing violence. We set out a lot of that in the serious violence strategy. Um, and it might be able to help with the short waves too. Um, there's some evidence that um, male on male homicides cluster even more in those most deprived uh, communities that often suffer a lot of those risk factors. However, we clearly also need something for for when we're in that sort of short wave moment, which seems to be where we are now. The latest uh, rise seems to um, have a lot of the characteristics of a short wave, and we need something, you know, immediately to try and bring that down. And there, I think focused enforcement, as I've tried to set out, I think can probably play a really important role. Uh, one point about that, though, I think, is what might help is one of the areas we struggle with is to fully understand what causes these kind of destabilizations within gangs and drug markets that, that really cause those sudden increases in violence. The literature and research on on uh, drugs and gangs and things like that, it tends to be quite polarized. This is what we found when looking through. If you're trying to find out about things like when gang X is having a, a beef with gang Y, um, you tend to almost reduce to kind of journalistic, very qualitative reports. And they're not often linked up to the data analysis. So uh, you can't really see when when gang X fights gang Y, does that cause um, the trend in violence to increase? So I think bringing that kind of street level intelligence, which, uh, you know, is present in, in police forces, no doubt about it, bringing it together with data analysis, I think, could be a really powerful uh, tool to help us on that. Other policies uh, supported by this re review include reductions in um, illicit drug demand. Um, clearly, it, it, the drug market can be tackled from that side and there's good evidence that perhaps it should be um, evidence around treatment and, and so on. Um, policies aimed at reducing uh, hazardous drinking as well. We found uh, good evidence that uh, there's, there's stronger correlation between alcohol and homicide in the countries that have the most hazardous drinking patterns, particularly spirit drinking, where that's the uh, drink of choice. Um, and finally, um, the reinforcement of anti-violent norms uh, from a young age also uh, found supporting evidence for that. So last slide of all, um, where is this uh, research going next? Well, um, we spoke a bit earlier about um, the kind of level of homicide across different countries. Um, and this is shown again here in these in the black boxes underneath the, the chart. And that very low homicide rates in East Asia in places like Japan, much higher rates in uh, Central and South America. And what the data show is that there's as these two graphs on this slide also show is that as you go from high homicide down to low homicide countries, you tend to get reductions in the percentage of male victim homicides and the percentage of homicides where the victims age 15 to 44. So you look at the chart on the bottom right and Brazil has a very high proportion of its homicides involving young and then the chart on the top left, the young males. Uh, whereas Japan, completely the opposite end of the spectrum. It is incredible that orange bar in the bottom right for Japan. They have virtually sort of eliminated uh, homicides between young men. So that's where this research is going next. What we want to do is try and work out how this has managed to be achieved in places like Japan. And it isn't just Japan. We talked about Australia earlier. Um, uh, they used to have a higher homicide rate than England Wales. They now have a lower rate. And much of that has been driven by um, the, the rate of homicides between young men is, is I think, about a 50% below ours, uh, significantly below. Um, uh, the exact figure is in the report. Um, so that's where the research is going next. We want to see, you know, what are these countries doing right uh, that we can learn from? Because... Obviously, at the moment, we are seeing a lot of homicides between uh, young men and we want to tackle them.
so uh, that's that's it from me. Um, I hope you found it uh, interesting. Uh, happy to take uh, any questions over email. My email address is there. And uh, don't forget um, the report uh, along with, in all its glory, lots of annexes and detail on the gov.uk website. And also there's lots and lots of data on there as well that we haven't released previously. So do have a look and uh, use that data. Thanks very much.